Okay, um, welcome uh, to the the next installment of the of the peer uh, virtual uh, seminar. Today, uh, we're joined by Daphna Basic uh, from the University of Virginia. Uh, as usual, I just want to remind people that these sessions are being recorded. Um, so, so please keep that in mind uh, when you ask questions, um, whether you'd be happy having your question show up uh, on YouTube or TikTok or something. Um, uh, um, I would just ask that during, during Daphne's talk that you hold, uh, you ask clarifying questions during the talk, but you hold any more um, in-depth uh, conceptual questions until the end. Um, and if you're here with us on Zoom, the way to um, uh, ask a question uh, either during the talk or at the end would be to raise your hand, um, uh, assuming you know people have been using Zoom uh, long enough, they, they, they know how to raise their hand in Zoom. And then we'll we'll ask um, uh, questions in order. But 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 again, hoping contrary to our usual style when we're in person, we're really trying to let the speaker finish and then open up to a to a broader discussion at the end. It's just easier to manage the, the questions that way. Um, if you're joining us via YouTube, please email your question to peer, P-I-E-R underscore fellowship at gse.harvard.edu. I think there are some instructions on, on how to do that uh, um, in the, um, the, pa the uh, page that you may have used to, to uh, join us. Okay, so uh, today uh, we have the pleasure be of, of seeing a talk by Daphna Basic. Daphna is Associate Professor of Education and Public Policy at the University of Virginia. Um, she's also Associate Director of Ed Policy Works, which is a joint collaboration between the Curry School of Education and Human Development and the Frank Batten School of um, Leadership and Public Policy. Daphna's research uh, addresses early childhood education policy with a focus on efforts to improve early childhood systems at scale. She's particularly interested in policies aimed at improving the early childhood workforce. Um, she works closely with early childhood policymakers in both Virginia and Louisiana. And as I understand, uh, Daphna is going to be talking about some results from both of those uh, states this afternoon. So um, uh, welcome, uh, Daphna. Um, I think, uh, are, are you ready to share your screen? I am ready. Let's see if it cooperates. Can you guys see that? Okay. I can. All right. Well, thank you so much um, for the welcome. And I am super excited to be here today and to share um, findings from a couple of studies from partnerships we have in uh, Louisiana and in Virginia around teacher turnover in early childhood education. So I wanted to start before I get into the specifics of those two papers by talking a little bit about these partnerships. We have been uh, my team and I have been working for uh, since around 2013 education um, and a little bit more recently with the Virginia Department of Education all around efforts to improve access to um, high quality early childhood education opportunities. Um, Louisiana and Virginia are very different places, but the partnership work um, in both has been similar in that 
the focus has really been around improving um, access to high quality opportunities for kids zero to five. And though both partnerships are um, with departments of education, both have been really uh, focused on the entire system of early childhood programs. And so how do we sort of uh, improve uh, not only just the pre-K programs that are already part of the uh, school system, but how do we coordinate with childcare, with Head Start, with family childcare homes, and kind of the whole system of ways we provide early care and education for kids. And so that's one sort of similarity in the partnership, like a real focus on system building. And another is a core belief that, that improving early childhood education um, at its core is about the teachers who are working with the kids and the idea that high quality um, early childhood education, we throw that term around, but what we're really talking about is the quality of interactions between the adults, the caregivers, the teachers who work with young kids and um, how we support them. And so I wanted to start with this um, uh, story from the New York Times, uh, why are our most important teachers paid the least? Kind of like a core question for us in the partnership. It has been around how we support early educators, how we deal with the kind of the dis disparities across the way we support early educators across schools, child care centers, Head Start, family child care homes. Um, and how we ensure that we build a system that can provide good experiences for kids where right now, as this notes, many early educators live on the edge of financial ruin. So that's kind of a, a, a huge part of uh, the motivation for the work in both contexts. And that has only gotten sort of more pronounced and um, more uh, urgent in light of COVID-19 and how hard hit um, the child care sector in particular has been by that and the teachers working within it. So this is a story from Time Magazine from last month uh, around the kind of decimation of the child care uh, industry dealing with the um, get the high levels of closures. The, this is an industry that's already working on the margins um, and uh, changes in child teacher ratios and what they're able to operate safely, huge declines in um, kids actually attending child care centers and what that has done both for the firms but also for the teachers working within uh, these child care settings. So in our own work in Louisiana and Virginia, we've been uh, tracking the experiences of early educators through a bunch of surveys throughout the COVID period, we are seeing sort of massive uh, increases, 20 percentage point increases in teacher depression during this time period, huge amounts of financial stress, food insecurity. Um, and so the question is, in general, both pre-COVID and especially now in the current context, the teachers who uh, work with young kids zero to five are facing really, really difficult um, work conditions, oftentimes very low pay um, and very pronounced levels of teacher turnover. Um, and in our work, we have been thinking about how we can work with our partners to think about policies that address those issues. So that's what I'll be talking about today. And I basically have three goals for the presentation. Uh, the first one, which is gonna highlight work um, our team has been doing in Louisiana is just around trying to show you new evidence on the prevalence of teacher turnover in early childhood. Um, it is uh, something we talk about a lot that, that turnover is a problem, but not something we have great evidence on. So excited to share some um, uh, data on exactly how much teachers turn over and which teachers turn over, et cetera. And then i um, super excited. That second bullet there is um, findings from a uh, an experiment that we did with our partners in Virginia around the impact of uh, financial incentive for teachers aimed at um, improving teacher retention. And then finally, since both one and two are both projects that have come through these partnerships with Louisiana and Virginia, I wanted to kind of highlight ways in which I think the partnership work has been incredibly important for uh, the research and hopefully the research has also been useful for the policymakers. Um, 
Okay, so before I get into uh, the specifics of the studies, I wanted to acknowledge my uh, three uh, fantastic main partners, uh, the Department of Education in Louisiana and the Early Childhood Office, the Early Childhood Team at the Virginia Department of Ed, and the Virginia Early Childhood Foundation, who has been partnering with us in Virginia to execute on uh, the preschool development grant, which I will be talking about. So they have been incredibly involved in everything I will be sharing today. And then the work itself is work that I have done with kind of our big team of researchers here at UVA um, and UCLA um, called the Study of Early Education Through Partnerships. And there are a whole bunch of great people involved in this work, but I put five on here who are co-authors for the specific papers that I'm working on um, who are tremendous. And then I wanted to particularly highlight Laura and Justin, my uh, postdoc and PhD students who are on the job market right now and are particularly terrific. So I wanted to pause and suggest folks consider hiring them. Um, all right, so with that set up, the first paper I'm going to talk about is this descriptive piece about teacher turnover, which is joint work with Laura at UVA and Anna Markowitz, uh, who's a professor at UCLA. Okay, I've already set this up a lot, but teacher turnover in early childhood, especially if it's occurring sort of within the year while kids are there, creates a lot of um, instability for children and families. And on the whole, it also creates serious problems for efforts to improve um, early childhood education. The biggest challenge when we think about reducing teacher turnover is that early childhood education um, in this country is provided through a very fragmented system. We have kids going to pre-K programs um, where teachers typically look a lot like K-12 teachers, but um, most kids zero to five who are attending some sort of early childhood education program are attending subsidized um, or unsubsidized child care centers or family child care homes or Head Start programs. And across these systems, um, we do everything very, very differently. So how we compensate teachers, how we support them, who we hire to do those jobs, what kids' experiences look like across settings varies um, tremendously. And in childcare in particular, many of the uh, teachers are earning very low wages, have few benefits, are relying on uh, government assisted pro assistance programs which are targeted towards families in poverty and are struggling with very hard um, economic conditions. And so it's not particularly surprising that in that context, um, there has been an issue with teacher turnover. And so there's been a lot of talk of late around how to address that turnover. But taking a step back, we actually don't have a very good sense of how much turnover there is um, and where it is, what kinds of teachers are leaving, when are they leaving? And the reason we don't, I know I'm talking to a group of people who do a lot of K-12 research on teachers. And in K-12 teacher research, what we are used to is the state longitudinal data systems in which we can observe a teacher get, get hired and a teacher move from one school to another school and really track teachers trajectories over time. And we have um, decades of research studying teacher labor markets and trying to understand who leaves and why they leave and where they go done, um, you know, by lots of the people who are on this call right now. Um, in early childhood education, the data systems are nothing like that because childcare are private businesses. No state has any sort of data system tracking um, the movements of childcare teachers from one center to another one, and certainly not from one sector. When I say sector, I mean like moving from childcare into Head Start or from Head Start into a family childcare home. There's no way to sort of look at the system at large and see where teachers are, are going and and so we have very little uh, understanding of the exact scope of the problem that we're trying to address. And that's what um, this paper I'm going to share is about. We have been working with Louisiana for a long time. And one of the novel things about Louisiana's appro approach to um, early childhood quality improvements is they have this quality rating and improvement system, which for those of you who aren't familiar with that term is kind of a accountability system to track program quality across early childhood settings. And um, the really interesting thing about Louisiana's QRIS is that as part of it, 
they go and conduct observations in every single publicly funded early childhood classroom twice a year. So that means every Head Start classroom serving toddlers or older children, uh, every pre-K classroom, every subsidized childcare classroom is getting observed multiple times a year. And so the purpose of that is to track quality and to ensure quality, but um, one sort of unintended uh, benefit of the data set is that because they have gone and um, found those teachers and observed those teachers fall, spring, fall, spring for multiple years now, um, it provides a unique opportunity to, for the first time across an entire state's early childhood system, observe where teachers are and when teachers exit, um, where do they go. So basically, what we are doing um, here is tracking um, 5,000, a little over 5,000 early educators that were observed in uh, subsidized child care, Head Start, and pre-K programs in fall of 2016 um, across all the different sites in Louisiana. And the idea is that we uh, basically looked for them that fall when they got observed and then said of those teachers that we saw getting an observation that fall, how many of them were still in that site come spring? And what about the next fall and the next spring? And so basically using the observation data, we've tried to uh, very painstakingly um, track these teachers. And I say painstakingly because there aren't IDs in this data set or any actual way to track the teachers other than sort of through fuzzy name matching and trying to find them across sites, which is what we've done. And so I think the data set is actually the first longitudinal data set tracking all the lead teachers in public early childhood systems in a state. And it allows us to see um, what the turnover looks like, which is what I will show you next. Okay, so the first kind of high level takeaway is that turnover in early childhood, not surprisingly, is much, much higher than what we observe in K-12. So um, the first thing I'm showing you is this um, graph that is showing the teachers that we observe in the fall of 2016 and what percentage of them are still there when the observation occurs in the spring of that um, same school year. And so what you can see is that even just from the fall to the spring, 12% of the teachers that we saw in the fall are no longer there by the spring. And then if we look to the following, the next fall, so this is fall 2016 compared to fall 2017, now we are at about two thirds of the teachers. So meaning two thirds of the teachers that were observed in fall of 2016 are no longer there by fall of 2017. And when we try to track it all the way out to the last kind of pre-COVID time period we have, we can see that a third of the teachers overall are um, still working at their specific site when we look for them three years out. So this is a really high level of um, turnover to begin with. And one question we had when we looked at this is, um, when a teacher leaves their site, is it because they are moving? We had heard a lot of things around childcare teachers um, moving to Head Start or Head Start teachers moving to pre-K programs that offer better um, potentially better supports or salaries or things like that. So what we did is say, okay, this, this figure I've showed you now is the likelihood that you're still working at your specific site where we observed you in fall 2016. But what if we said, um, what's the likelihood we observe you anywhere um, in Louisiana working in a publicly funded program? And that's this um, red line that I've superimposed on top. And you can see it's like really, really closely tracking the original line, um, suggesting that the vast majority of teacher turnover that we observe in um, Louisiana is not teachers switching from one site to another site, but rather them entering and exiting altogether from um, the publicly funded early childhood programs in the state. All right, this next slide was not in the presentation, but Tom, I put it in just because of our conversation because I wanted to show you. Tom asked me what about the new entrants? So this figure is uh, showing 
um, what happens where we say, okay, we actually have data starting in 2015, not 2016. So let's split this out by those teachers who we ever observed the previous year in fall or spring of 2015 and break out the analysis to say, if you have been there last year versus if this is um, the first time we're observing you. And you can see that there are vast, vast differences in the turnover rates of um, teachers who are new entrants, such that of the new entrants, uh, only 47% of the new entrants in fall 2016 were still there in fall 2017. So really driven by the new entrants. And then the last of these figures I wanted to show you, but in some ways I think, um, you know, a really important one has to do with the variability in these turnover rates across the different types of early childhood programs. So this is like the school based programs compared to the child care settings and the head starts. So this red line here is similar to what I showed you before, but these are school based pre K teachers. And so you could see that here only very, very few pre-K teachers are leaving within uh, between the fall and the spring, 96% of them. And we are still at 75% of the teachers by the fall and roughly 50% of them three years out. If I add in the green line for Head Start or the lowest, the blue line for childcare, it is showing you just how much more pronounced the turnover program is among childcare um, teachers, lead teachers compared to pre-K school-based teachers. And so um, I think one of the two kind of most staggering figures here are of the lead teachers working in child care centers in fall 2016, fully 20% of them had left by the time we looked for them in the spring. So a huge amount drop of teachers there and only a quarter of them are still there three years out compared to twice as many of the teachers working in pre-K settings. And so there are a lot of potential explanations for what might be driving these um, sector differences. And um, we could discuss a lot of them. They are very different um, workforces with a lot of different conditions. But one thing I wanted to highlight, which sets the stage for the next study I'll share, is the extremely different um, uh, compensation across these settings. So the uh, dark blue bars are for assistant teachers. The lighter ones are lead teachers. And this is highlighting the estimated annual earnings of um, teachers across child care centers, Head Start, and uh, pre-K programs in the schools. This is our own data from a survey we did with over a thousand teachers in two Louisiana parishes. Um, and what you can see if you just focus on childcare and schools is that um, the average annual wages of the lead teachers in our sample are just under twenty thousand um, dollars a year so almost exactly half the pay that we are seeing for lead teachers um, working in school-based settings and thinking about quality improvement and system building across early childhood when you have these kind of massive disparities across the main sectors providing uh, creates a lot of uh, challenges which is what um, we've been working on over time. So I think to sort of wrap up the Louisiana side of the talk, uh, I, we're super excited to have a data set that can give us like accurate information about how serious the turnover pro program problem is. Um, we uh, are documenting very high um, rates of turnover in early childhood in general relative to K-12 um, and that the vast majority of the turnover is exits altogether as opposed to movements across um, sectors. And um, what's really clear is that the issue is very, very pronounced um, for childcare teachers who are the ones who uh, face in many ways the hardest work conditions. Um, okay, so there have been um, major calls to address these issues. The National Academy of Science has put out a report called, uh, calling for uh, transforming the workforce. And one major piece of this has been around issues of addressing compensation disparities across sectors or the need for sort of monetary supports for teachers. And so that is my segue to the other paper that I wanted to share with you called The Effects of Financial Incentives on Teacher Return Retention in Early Childhood Education. And this one is evidence from our Virginia partnership. Okay, 
So as I said, there is increasingly awareness that early childhood is incredibly important for um, an important period in young kids' lives, that early childhood education can um, have a profound effect on it, and that the working conditions of early educators are problematic for all sorts of reasons, including this kind of high level of stability, stress, um, poverty among early educators. So um, there have been a number of calls for uh, programs to address some of these. That first headline is from San Francisco, uh, who's currently implementing a stipend program for early educators. Um, that was from uh, October 2019, so pre-pandemic. And then many states are also talking right now about how to use their federal CARES dollars um, in response to COVID to try to support early educators through some form of incentive pay um, for their work uh, during COVID. So there is kind of heightened interest in these type of uh, incentive effort. And there is some research about this in an early childhood setting, but to date, the research has not really been about the impact of the uh, incentives, and there, we don't have really kind of causal evidence about whether or not um, giving teachers financial incentives has impact on uh, turnover, which is the uh, outcome that we are super interested to hear uh, and our partners are, but any outcome at all. And so um, recently there was kind of a review of existing teacher retention programs in early childhood and there were kind of 11 found that have these kind of financial supplements to try to reduce turnover. But the research hasn't been about the impact and has oftentimes either not had a control group at all or um, had a not random control group. And so the things we know from these studies um, has been kind of the perceptions of the teachers around how they have felt about getting the incentive. So here is one out of this Minnesota study, and they asked the teachers after they gave them a bonus whether they thought that that influenced their decision to stay in the workforce. And you can see that, um, you know, over half of the teachers uh, somewhat agreed or strongly agreed that yes, this access to resources mattered. But again, without a control group, and really just the teacher's perceptions. All right, so our team had a really unique opportunity to tackle this question through um, what was then a very new partnership for us with the Virginia Department of Ed. So I put some um, pictures up here, much to the uh, chagrin of um, my two co-authors who are in the bottom picture, Justin and Molly. Uh, but this is our um, partner in Virginia, Jenna Conway, who is the Chief School Readiness Officer for Virginia, um, who is leading Virginia's preschool development grant. One interesting fact about Jenna is that prior to becoming our Chief School Readiness Officer in Virginia, she was the head of early childhood in Louisiana and was our partner there. And so, um, Roughly around the time that Virginia received this preschool development grant or a little bit before Jenna um, moved from Louisiana to Virginia and suggested that we continue our partnership that had been go going on for four or five years by that point, bring it to the Virginia context and support Virginia's preschool development grant which was a $9.9 million federal preschool development grant aimed at system building in early childhood. So we were super excited to bring this partnership that had been going great in Louisiana to Virginia where we live and look at these issues. We got particularly excited when the press release came out on what um, we were gonna do with the preschool development grant. And you can see it's a $9.9 .9 million grant and it said nearly half of the federal funds will directly support innovative early educators. So that seemed pretty interesting. And then if we uh, look further at what this press release said, it said nearly $4 million of this funding will directly support early childhood educators across the Commonwealth to accelerate the implementation of higher standards and reduce turnover. Uh, and they're gonna receive financial incentives. So that was, extremely interesting to us. Um, and um, we sort of came back to Jenna and to the partnership and said like, oh, we should find a way to study this piece of the effort. Like if we are putting nearly half this um, large federal grant towards supporting teachers, um, we should think about how to study and, and um, understand the impact of that. Um, so uh, Jenna's idea and the team's interest was that through this um, recognition program, we could reduce teacher stress, improve well-being, improve teacher-child interactions, job satisfaction, and ultimately 
uh, improve stability in early childhood education. Uh, the challenge was that this was a one year fixed time point grant. We had a year to spend these dollars and we had to move incredibly fast to think about how to deliver to the incentives and who should get the incentives and how this was all going to work. So who gets them? How large are they? We had a pool of money. There's obviously lots of early educators in Virginia. How are we going to make this work? And then my team was very focused on, okay, but also can we use this to provide rigorous experimental evidence on the impact of the financial supports for early childhood workforce? And I'm happy to talk more about that in the um, Q&A. So here is where uh, we landed on Virginia's teacher recognition program. Um, ultimately, we decided that the recognition program was gonna provide $1,500 financial incentives and the incentives were going to be tied to teachers staying at their specific PDG sites. So there are uh, PDG sites, including child care centers, Head Starts, pre-Ks, also family child care homes, though I'm not going to talk about that piece of it today. Um, and the idea was to receive your incentive, you would have to stay being employed at that particular PDG site. The eligibility was pretty broad. It was any early childhood educator working in a PDG site. So it could be teachers, assistant teachers, aides, staff. The conditions were that you had to be working directly with children zero to five. So meaning if we were in a pre-K program and you were working with uh, first graders, it wouldn't count, but as long as the kids were zero to five and you were working directly with children 30 or more hours a week in any of these PDG sites, you were eligible. Um, some things that helped a lot for the design of the RCT, initially the PDG included 25 Virginia cities and counties, which were together comprised roughly 20% 20, 20 of the uh, state, the state's population, um, and all publicly funded early childhood programs within those cities and counties were invited to participate. Um, and so that was going to be the sample, but then we also had a large urban county that wanted to participate and we did not have enough dollars to say, sure, you can participate and we would be able to give all teachers in your sites um, this $1,500 recognition program. So, um, you know, for those of you who have been to lots of these talks, that obviously raises this um, moment and this opportunity to say, okay, we don't have enough resources to serve everyone. Maybe this could be an opportunity for some sort of lottery or randomization in order to figure out which sites do and don't um, receive the recognition program. All right, so I'll describe the two experiments that ended up coming out of this um, setup. And then today I'll only talk about the first of those, but I'm happy to talk about the second one in the Q&A too. So the question for the first study was, what is the impact of the offer of a financial uh, incentive program on teacher retention? And this we did in that one large urban community that came on um, knowing that not all of their sites and teachers could participate. So ultimately the way this worked is in this large urban community, all publicly funded programs were allowed to sign up to be part of the PDG. And they knew that by signing up, they would get a set of supports. The PDG has a bunch of different things going on around classroom observations and supports and coordinated enrollment for signing up kids. So there's a lot of different pieces, but they knew that they may or may not be selected to be part of the teacher recognition program. Um, ultimately, um, a bunch of sites have volunteered and we were able to include all of them in the study, but randomize them to some sites being eligible for the recognition program and some not. So 75 sites and about 580 teachers for this um, cluster randomized trial. Um, so for this group, the treatment stat, uh, group was eligible to receive up to $1,500. And it was paid to them in roughly, I have, I have three months intervals here, but it was more like two and a half months. Roughly every two and a half months, our partners verified that the teacher was still employed at that specific site where they started. And if they were still at that specific site, they got a check for $500. And so if they continue to be there for the whole time period, which started in May, and went through December, then ultimately they would receive 
all three payments. So $500 for the first one, $500 for the second, $500 for the third. If they left between, say, the first period and the second period, they got to keep that first $500, but they would not get the second or third one. So to receive all $1,500, you would need to stay throughout the um, whole period. There was no restrictions on what you did with the money. This was just a check for you to use however uh, you wanted to. And the comparison group, the sites that were not randomized to be part of the teacher recognition program did not receive this um, at all. And then in study two, which was those 25 communities I mentioned that had signed up first, we had enough resources to offer the recognition program to all the teachers working in the sites that wanted to participate in the PDG. So ultimately that was 340 sites and a almost 2000 teachers um, and all of them could receive up to $1,500. But what we ended up randomizing for that bigger group is how they received those um, payments. So one group could receive the payments all $1,500 at the very end um, at the eight, roughly eight months point if they were still employed at their site. And the comparison group received it the way I described it in the first study. So three payments of $500 a piece. Um, and the purpose of doing that, the research question was, does the timing and frequency of the payments matter? But to be more concrete on sort of the why we wanted to answer that question, our partners were really um, concerned about what at the state level they can do around compensation. So one thing that they felt they could do would be something like a tax credit for early educators, or that is a thing that our partner, uh, Jenna, who is leading things in Virginia now, had successfully implemented in Louisiana. Um, so that was kind of front of mind as one strategy. But the thing about a tax credit is that it happens annually. Um, and the concern was maybe an annual annual payment of uh, a tax credit isn't going to work with this very low income workforce. And maybe it's really important to kind of simulate what it would be like to just increase your pay weekly, biweekly. Now there's a tension because administratively, like we did not have the capacity to actually start sending people checks every two weeks, but the three versus one ended up being this middle ground test case to say like, does it make a difference if they get a little bit of money along the way versus one payment um, lump sum. So uh, Daphna, this is uh, Tom, just one quick clarifying question. Sure. What, what determined whether a site was included in study one versus study two? I, I, I think you, you mentioned this, but I, but I, I missed it. Yeah, good question. So um, they are in two separate communities. So basically we had the vast majority of communities are in study two. They were basically all the communities that had initially signed up to be in the PDG and um, let their child care centers, Head Starts, Pre-K signed up. We saw how much that was and we said, yes, we have enough money to do this for all the teachers we estimate work in these sites. And then there was a large urban community that came on at the end. Oh, and so we added them on. And when we did, we said like, you can come on, but there are not sufficient resources to guarantee this for everyone. So by coming on, you have to be open to the scenario where um, we, will we don't unfortunately have the resources to include everyone but we do feel like it is a unique opportunity to learn about the impact of this and i think um our local partners in that community were um you know like i can talk more about it it's, it's a challenging thing to tell some early educators they would receive this and others not um but they were open to the idea that this could provide really important new evidence and ultimately let us um sort of move forward with that randomization okay thanks all right, so I'm going to talk mostly about study one, and this is um, the sample for that uh, study. So again, this is the three payments of $500 compared to no payments at all. And these are the descriptive statistics for the whole sample. And so you can see that about a quarter of our sample was uh, were white, we had about a quarter that was Hispanic or Latino, 20% black, and actually a very um, large proportion of also Asian uh, teachers in this more urban community, as well as mixed race um, families, or teachers rather. On average, teachers had 10 years of experience, about half of them had a bachelor's degree, average earnings were $38,000 um, a year, um, and 
that bottom one where it says employment verified at eight months, 82% um, of the sample overall that was still employed at their starting site when we came back eight months later. So basically thinking about that as a turnover rate of, you know, 18% of the teachers who were there at the beginning overall uh, was no longer there eight months later. Okay, so that's the sample. Um, and then I wanted to sort of show you how that breaks down across um, child care and school based settings. I'll pause to say we did include family child care homes, but they're not in what I'm presenting today. Um, and we did include Head Start programs, but the way that we have included them, they're in what I'm presenting, but they are lumped with the schools if they operate within school buildings and lumped with child care if they are in community um, organizations. So um, the first thing I want to highlight is just how completely uh, different our lead teachers looked across the two samples. So you can see that among uh, pre-K teachers working in the public schools, 71% of them were white compared to 24% white in um, the child care sector. So racially a really different looking um, sample. Um, if you look at their education levels, all of the lead teachers working in the public schools uh, had a bachelor's degree, whereas only half of them did in the child care centers. Uh, the wages of the lead teachers in the schools were twice as high as the wages of the teachers in child care, about $35,000 relative to $70,000, um, and really on every measure quite different um, descriptively. And the last one I'll sort of highlight is that the turnover rates, not surprisingly, and sort of in keeping with what I showed you from Louisiana, are also quite different. So at the end of this period, um, ignoring the RCT, nearly all the lead teachers in the public schools were still in their position compared to 17% of the uh, child care lead teachers um, being gone. And as I said, the study was not limited to the lead teachers. We also included assistant teachers, floaters, staff, anyone working directly with kids. So adding in those assistant teachers that were also part of our sample, this is, I know, a lot to look at, but a couple of things I'll highlight. Um, first, uh, the assistant teachers are always going to be, uh, in our sample, had a lower levels of education relative to the lead teachers, that is, um, like 36% of the assistants had a bachelor's degree as compared to 48% in um, childcare. The wages of the teachers uh, also followed that part pattern and just sort of putting that in your head because it will relate to our results, but the assistant teachers in childcare clearly are the group with the lowest levels of education, the, high, the lowest earnings, the lowest supports across any measure we looked at. Daphne, sorry, just another clarifying question. Sure. So, um, so within this, do you have any information about either the, the type of institution somebody got a bachelor's degree from or, or what their major was or, or anything like that? Like, so. Um, yeah, that's a good question. And um, yes, we do though, not in this table and not off the top of my head, but the way we have this information is that we all, like the information in this table is from a survey that we collected ourselves at the beginning of the study and we're fortunate enough to get really high response rates. So for most people, we have this information and we don't have a ton of information about like where you got your degree exactly, but I think we do know if it's in early childhood education versus in some other topic or what you studied as part of it. So- Definitely, this is Eric. Hi, can I ask a clarifying question too? Sorry if you right. mentioned this before, but for the school leads column, the far right, is it so different because the, they're being treated the same way that a kindergarten or first grade teacher would be treated, like selected in the same way, paid in yep. the same way? Yeah, they are basically school employees working in, you know, in the Virginia public schools. And so everything about them, you know, how they would be hired, licensed, um, who they are is really comparable to K-12 teachers. So there might be like paraprofessionals or teacher's aides in second grade or third grade that are that look like the assistants in the schools too? 
Yes, exactly. So, so likely the assist, the column for assistance looks really similar to what just assistance in the public schools look like in general. And um, I don't have it here, but across a whole bunch of other work that we've done, we've usually like, so we've done a bunch of work on COVID and how it's impacted teachers. And across the board, we see that um, assistant teachers in schools are faring better than either leads or assistant teachers in the childcare sector, as far as kind of like how they are faring in COVID and their resources and their likelihood of like having uh, food insecurity or things like that. So they are kind of, you can see that they obviously have like way lower education and pay than the teachers, but also are kind of in the middle between leads and assistance for childcare. Thanks, Eric. Any other clarifying things? All right. Um, and so just to highlight, these are basically the retention rates across these groups. Again, before we randomize anything, um, you can see that in the public schools, most, like I said, nearly all lead teachers did not leave over this eight uh, month period, relatively few of the assistants left. And then we have 83% of the lead teachers leaving over this period in childcare and set or 83% staying, 17% leaving, and a quarter of the assistant teachers leaving over this time period. So again, this is just going to be important because to foreshadow where we end up, we are going to see very uh, large impacts for childcare and within childcare, very large impacts for the assistant teachers who uh, presumably needed these resources the most. Okay, so let me show you our results. Um, so this is just pretty much what I showed you uh, to begin with. This is our overall sample and the overall uh, retention uh, for uh, the group. So this is saying in the compare, this is now the comparison group, 75% um, of the teachers were still observed at the eight month point. Um, so a quarter of teachers in the control group left their program by the time we came back um, eight months later. And then this is the group with uh, the teacher recognition program. So there you can see that 86% of them were retained. So the difference between that is about uh, 11 percentage points. So retention increased uh, quite significantly across the board. Um, but then we said, okay, let's separate this out because we know that the center-based teachers and the school-based teachers are such a different population, such a different compensation, et cetera. So again, these light blue bars are the comparison groups in centers and in schools. You can see that 94% of the comparison group in the schools was still there at the end of the study. 70% of the center-based teachers uh, was still there in the comparison group. Um, and then here are uh, the treatment group. And so I think what's really striking about this is you can see that for the school-based teachers, we basically saw no changes at all. It basically had uh, a, a, a zero uh, impact for that group. But for the center-based teachers, this $1,500, this offer of a $1,500 recognition program had an extremely large impact, reducing turnover from 30 percentage, 30 percent of the teachers being gone within an eight month period to 15 percent of uh, teachers gone for those who received the recognition program. So that was uh, to us a very large impact of the program. And then we also broke the results by the lead versus the assistant teachers. And you can see that what's really, really driving our results here are the assistant teachers in these sites where only 60% of, uh, of our control group was still observed compared to 84% of assistant teachers who were um, offered the recognition program. So, um, you know, I, I would say large overall effects of 11 percentage uh, 11 percentage points for the overall group, but then driven by childcare and within childcare driven by the assistant teachers. So Daphna, one, like presumably one hypothesis to explain this is, um, you know, the $1,500 represented a bigger percentage change for, for the folks in childcare and for the, um, the assistant teachers, but but if you had any data on their prior earnings, um, you might even be able to say, okay, 
within among those, presumably there are some higher earning folks, even in the child care centers. Yeah, but, that's a great point. I mean, we do, because what I showed you in the descriptive tables is a pre, it's, it's the teachers right. describing their wages in the pre-period. So we know teacher reported wages and we can look at that. I mean, it is true that the Oh, the overarching point is that for child care teachers, this re represented a 5% um, increase in wage and a much smaller one for the uh, lead teachers who I said were on, on average making twice as much as child care teachers. But you're right, we can look at how this varies by what your actual pay was um, in the pre-period and whether there are differences based on your pay, which we haven't done yet, but that's a great idea. Okay, so... I know I don't have a, a, a ton more time and I was trying to time it so that we would have lots of time for discussions. So um, let me say that one of the big things that we are interested in too is the mechanisms for this. And to get at the mechanisms for this work, we did a large uh, post survey. It was a little impacted by the fact that it ended up um, happening uh, during COVID where there were a lot of stressors, but luckily I'm thrilled that the actual study, like the actual payments and the whole retention piece uh, ended uh, a little bit before COVID hit. So it didn't mess with the actual randomization or getting the resources to the teachers. So we have this survey and in the survey, what we're gonna be able to look is like at is a whole host of things around teacher stress, teacher financial um, stability, uh, food insecurity, job attachment, job satisfaction, all those kinds of things. We haven't looked at it yet, but that will allow us to sort of see if the recognition program had impact on those things. I did wanna show you what it is that teachers said they were using uh, the resources for. So this is just asking teachers did the recognition grant help you with any of the following expenses? And you can see that, you know, that some teachers found it helpful in all sorts of ways, but we were interested in, did you use it for PD? Did you use it for addressing emergencies, savings, materials for your classroom, et cetera? And by far the most common response for how this money got used is for uh, basic needs. So housing, food, and bills. Um, and so, and then, and then student loan debt was the next more, most common after that. Um, we have a really, really remarkable amount of write-in comments on the survey. I think the recognition program was incredibly well received and people were very grateful and used the survey in part to make the case for the continuation of the program. So I also wanted to show you really quickly just a couple of the, uh, just two because I tried to rein myself in, but some of this stuff um, I think is, is, is some of the most important stuff to have come out of it. But it says, I remember the day teachers started receiving their checks and there was such a buzz of excitement. I know for one of the teachers receiving that check meant she could finally make necessary car repairs after having an accident. I know all the teachers who were eligible appreciated it and it definitely made an impact on how long they continued to work at the site. Or another one, early educators are so often left out of the conversation when it comes to teaching. This grant has shown that our work matters. I'm hopeful that one day being respected and recognized for what we do will be the norm in our society. Um, as far as kind of other write-in quotes, so, so many about how this mattered for ensuring that their family had food, ensuring that they could deal with emergency hospital trips, ensuring that they um, were able to uh, pay rent and, you know, uh, uh, the timing of the survey, um, which happened in the spring of 2020, coincided with COVID. So teachers dealing a lot with um, the impact of COVID as well and highlighting how uh, the resources helped them with uh, being out of work or other um, crises that were happening to their families. All right. So uh, I'm very excited to share this. This is uh, Justin shared it at APAM for the first time last week, and this is my first time um, getting to talk about the results. I think it's really uh, strong experimental evidence that financial incentives for early educators make a big difference on teacher turnover. Uh, I think uh, the number that sticks with me is that um, this $1,500 incentive, or uh, if you think of it as like 75 cents more per hour for a worker, um, reduced this eight month teacher turnover rate in half from 30% to 15 percent um, and the results suggest that the teachers in settings with the greatest turnover right now and also the lowest wages benefited the most. Um, we are uh, 
doing a bunch to continue this, both on kind of the research front and the policy front. So um, this year we are doing a couple of new RCTs. Um, I didn't talk about the results from study two, but I will briefly say that remember study two is the one in which we were saying, um, okay, well, does it matter if we give them these three payments of 500, 500, 500, or just give them a lump sum payment of $1,500 if they're still there at the end? We found that that contrast also had an impact where teachers who received the three payments were about five percentage points um, more likely to stay at their jobs than those who received it as a lump sum at the end. So for the same amount of money, access to the resources sooner um, made a difference. That has led us to do an RCT this year, trying to move to even um, higher frequency setup. We are comparing three payments to six payments um, to see if sort of uh, much more kind of con consistent ready access to those resources matter. We are also uh, doing kind of like an informational in uh, texting intervention on top of it because our survey suggested that up to a quarter of the teachers said they didn't actually understand they weren't allowed to leave their site in order to get the money. They, they didn't really understand all the rules. And so we are trying to make sure that the state policy that gets com community, communicated to communities and then to leaders really gets directly to the teachers through this texting intervention and making sure they understand the rules and understand how it works. Um, and then long term, of course, the idea is this is a kind of a short term incentive program but do the benefits of this last? What are the impacts of it on quality? What are the impacts on it for kids? Does this seem like a sustainable solution is you know, high on our list of things to look into it. And then I just wanted to, before I sort of like wrap up and open it up for questions, I wanted to sort of um, highlight the kind of importance of the partnership for both of these studies. I think um, you know, we have been really, really excited to see our partners use the work to um, work on it, um, efforts to support early educators, both in Virginia and in Louisiana. Um, our uh, our governor just allocated $3 million in state funds to expand on the federal dollars in Virginia so that we could expand the teacher recognition program this year to more um, child care teachers, which has been incredibly um, exciting and um, nice to see the program grow. And we're thinking about sort of long-term sustainable approaches to address compensation. And in Louisiana, our team is working with them on a, a report in response to a Senate resolution asking for uh, a study of issues of compensation, turnover, et cetera. So I think it's been rewarding to be able to give our partners this information and work with them on it. I also think from a research perspective, there is sometimes this sense that uh, there is this kind of work you do with partners where you are trying to be helpful to them as part of a service. Um, and maybe there is a trade off between kind of the rigor and the quality of the re research relative to what um, because of timelines and priorities than what you might do independently. For me personally, I have found that um, working with our partners has allowed me to do, uh, I think, way more rigorous, more interesting, more kind of uh, higher quality research than I would have been able to do uh, by myself. I think I have, since graduate school, wanted to study these issues of turnover in early childhood and wanted a data set to allow me to do that. I would have never really realized that the accountability data set in, in Louisiana provided that opportunity without having worked with them for years. And without this partnership with uh, first in Louisiana and then with Jenna as she moved to Virginia, there is no way at all we would have had the opportunity to randomize this um, fairly substantial in scope uh, incentive. So incredibly grateful to have partners in, across these three agencies who are really, really committed to both, you know, trying new policies, but also ensuring that we are careful to embed opportunities to learn as we do it. And it's just been an incredibly uh, rewarding thing for me to do and an exciting thing to get to share with you all. So um, thank you. And I'm excited to now discuss. Sorry, I, st I didn't realize I was still muted. Thank you, Daphna, for um, your talk. Uh, just a reminder to folks, if you have questions, um, please raise your hand using the Zoom um, uh, uh, 
uh, functions within the participant box at, at the bottom that gives you opportunity. If you click there to, to, to raise your hand and you'll show up on our screen. So the first question uh, is from Peter Blair. Peter, you're, you're, Peter you're, you're still muted too. Um, <laughs> Daphne, thank you so much for a really great presentation on an incredibly important topic. I wanted to ask, are you able to look at whether there is, um, whether these effects are permanent? Um, initially you showed that for returning teachers in a sense, kind of like their retention curve was higher than for first time teachers. I'm wondering if like this treatment like shifts the, the treated teachers up to that kind of like returning teacher profile or if you just see kind of like a natural decay as you would have seen in the absence of the program? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, I think a little bit TBD, but I think we should be able to. Like I said, we are in the field right now on the second wave of this data. It's in the same community, same RCT. And through that, we are once again verifying their employment, which is, I should say, we are not verifying our employment. The Virginia Early Childhood Foundation, our partners are verifying their em employment, which is really, really neat. And so, yes, like ultimately we will know if teachers that we saw in the first year of the study are still there at the site and we'll be able to look at, you know, do we see persistence in these effects or is it sort of like this one time you stayed in order to get your payments, but once you got your payments, um, teachers left or how to think about kind of like how much stickiness mm -hmm. there is to it. So just a quick follow up to Peter's question, um, which I, I think is a really interesting one, is would the teachers have any reason to believe that they would still be part of this treatment this year? Like, or, or were they told, no, this is a one year thing? Like, like, so whether, might they be thinking coming back, well, maybe we'll get this $1,500 again. Yeah, I mean, I think they were, uh, at least very hopeful that it would continue. Like I said, the surveys included a lot of sort of pleas to, the, our, our survey was not a state survey, but they wrote a lot about like, please don't stop this program. This made a huge difference for us. It, we really need to, to continue. We also surveyed, you know, child care directors. It was extremely well uh, appreciated as a program. I think there were no specific um, promises around what would happen for this year. And we have sort of, been very fortunate to be able to continue it this year. Uh, so like I said, the program itself happened through the pilot year of this PDG Birth Through Five grant, and that was a 12-month grant. And while we were doing it, we were just kind of like, how can we do and learn the most within this one-year period? We then, uh, as a team applied for a like three year continuation grant from the feds to do it. And we're very fortunate that actually both Louisiana and Virginia were selected to have the three year extension. And so kind of late in the year, we were, uh, we found out that um, yes, we would get more funds and we could continue the program. But I think that was not uh, very clear to the teachers in the study that the program was continuing or how their employment linked to that. Because it would be nice, like if there was at least a subset for whom you discontinued it. <laughs> because, like, one question is: Are these bonuses a way to sort of get people through, like, that early teacher turnover period, so that once they've been through it, you don't, like, you don't have to, you, you like have them, they've built relationships with the parents, they've built relationships with the people in the centers. Maybe once they've gotten over that first year hump. Yeah, I mean, I think- uh, They'll two, stick more. Two reactions. One, at a very kind of like basic level, I think we can look at, but haven't looked at, whether the uh, results are driven by the um, more novice teachers, because in, you know, we have pretty detailed information around like their experience and how long they've been there. So we can check. I think, you know, big picture, um, I think, you know, the, the pay that these teachers are getting is very, very low. So my overarching thought about it is like, we do kind of need to, as a society, make a much bigger investment in how we're um, compensating these childcare workers and that that disparity between their pay rates uh, compared to how we, you know, pay 
K-12 teachers who we already are concerned about or with compensation issues as well. I mean, I think, I think that so many of our teachers report um, that they don't have enough food or that they don't have, you know, that they're experiencing pronou pronounced financial stress is a serious concern, even if like we didn't, you know, like see these turnover issues. But yes, I think in it is true that the turnover is a per, is particularly pronounced with these new teachers and finding some way to stabilize them would be huge. Great. Next question, Matt Leonard. Hi Daphna, thank you for uh, an incredibly interesting and relevant talk. Um, I wanted to ask about uh, the cost factor here. So we can think about turnover costs as direct in that they involve more recruitment, training, marketing, um, sort of like central office costs, and then the indirect costs of replacing, for example, an experienced ECE teacher with a novice ECE teacher, costs that have been estimated to be in the you know, tens of thousands per student or hundreds of thousands uh, for a classroom in terms of lost student achievement or costs to students in terms of achievement. And so I'm wondering if you have thought about the ways in which this $1,500 or fi phased in $500 incentive um, relates to both direct and indirect costs uh, to both the system and to uh, loss in student achievement? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think, you know, it's in some ways trickier to answer it or to even make estimates relative to K-12 where it's it's so, you know, we don't have great um, estimates on like the value added of toddler teachers or things like that in long-term student achievement. But I think that the idea of, you know, we do know some about the impacts of turnover in K-12. And I think that, um, there's every reason to think that the within year piece of turnover is even more damaging for very young kids who are reliant on these kind of stable relationships with adults and that for, for the kids themselves, there's a direct cost. How we would, how we would sort of uh, put you know, dollars on that, I'm, I, I haven't thought too much about. I think that there are kind of the returns to experience that we've talked about, but there's also so much of our efforts around quality improvement in early childhood has to do with uh, coaching intervention and professional development interventions. And I think to us, one of the really striking things, um, our partners in both states have worked really hard on those things. But if you are seeing so many of your teachers leave, and if when they leave, they don't show up in another child care center in your system or in any system, then those are really lost investments um, as well. So just thinking about kind of the, the money we put into kind of like curriculum or um, into PD or into coaching when the teachers are leaving at that high rate is, you know, very serious. So I, I guess to us, it's kind of like we, we sort of have to get some traction on the turnover issue and the compensation issue probably first before making these other investments or we're, um, we're not throwing those resources away. There's a lot of really good evidence done by a lot of people who are on this call right now around the impact of early childhood uh, professional development and supports, and that's really important too, but it just gets um, really watered down, like you said, um, if um, you have teachers leaving at these high rates. So next question, Eric Taylor. Hey, Daphna. Um, you showed us that the effects of the treatment were very different across the school and childcare sort of sectors. And the salaries are very different too, which sort of makes us want to think that the salaries are the difference, but there are other things that differ about those sectors. Like at another large urban district, DC nearby, like we found that principals actually were willing to give up predicted um, teacher performance for uh, teachers who are more likely to stick around. That is, they were thinking consciously about turnover. And there may also be just like implicit or explicit contracts that are different. So I just wanna upvote Tom's idea of using the within sector baseline salary differences to see if that predicts the treatment effects. And in fact, go one step further and like, if there is common support across the sectors, in that common support, do you get similar, you know, if you took the interaction between baseline salary and the treatment effect, is that the same for the school sector and the childcare sector, if there's some common support in the salaries? Yeah, um, you're making me think that would a be pretty indicative. Um, salary. Those are great questions. I mean, so one, 
we haven't done that and we definitely should. And I don't know off the top of my head, but when we looked at household income, which is different than our wages, when we looked at household income, there is very, very little common support. Like these workforces look real, real different. Like we have uh, something like 40% of the childcare workforce um, in Virginia is making under $20,000 a year. And so like a really high poverty workforce and then that, or that's household income, not even wages um, compared to the school-based teachers. So there isn't a ton, um, but we should still look at it even within sectors. Um, and the other sort of thing that is kind of funky about our study and was a product of, you know, like this very short time period is really, if you were gonna design this um, from scratch, you would have not started a, a teacher recognition incentive program in May to go to December. Like that was just kind of a funky uh, time period for it relative to kind of um, when you might think is an appropriate time to leave a school-based job. And so we do wonder what things would have looked like for the teachers if this was like more aligned with the actual school year. Um, in childcare, there's less of like a link to the kind of fall spring timeline. Um, so that's that's another factor that is a little funky and in this year's version is much more aligned to um, the school year and we'll just have to see how um, it looks. But I guess it's more that um, I think that for the school, even those teachers who leave might be much more likely to do it come June when the school year has ended or something. And the time we looked at is kind of a strange time to look. But thank you, those are great points. Great. Andrew? So I think we have time for one more, Andrew. Hey, Daphne. Uh, this is really great um, uh, and awesome to see some Kaplan-Meier survival curves in, uh, in your first uh, part of your presentation. <laughs> that was great to see. I, I teach survival analysis. It's always fun. Uh, but a question about um, uh, the, the um, design and power, just to, to have a different kind of question here. Um, you know, we, we were looking, um, I was texting Luke about your standard errors and how large they are. And I don't want people to get too discouraged about doing a cluster randomized trial because there are certainly power issues. But I was wondering if you could like talk a little bit, peel back the curtain a little bit about um, about power and you know if even if these effects were true if you did it again it is a chance with those standard errors that you might not find a statistically significant effect even if there's something true out there so um, did you how did you think about that uh, about how many sites you needed um, did you think about matching to increase power or, or what advice would you have for people trying to take on um, experiments like these yeah I mean so at a, as a first order thing, you know, when we are like spending a bunch of time trying to convince our partners that they should let us do an experiment, there was also a strong feeling like, are we ever going to be able to detect something? Because the last thing we want is to have like the first RCT of giving teachers pay, but set it up in a way where we couldn't even detect effects if they were there. Um, so we were very concerned and you saw uh, Vivian Wong is a co-author on this and she helped us a lot on the kind of design side. And we were particularly concerned around kind of uh, the, the smaller study of uh, the, the one that I focus on today, which was uh, less sites and um, in some ways kind of a key study of whether the recognition program mattered. And so it was very stressful all the way through because basically we needed sites to volunteer and we had kind of a threshold in mind where we would proceed versus not proceed if we didn't get enough sites to volunteer to be in this. This was like a volunteer study. But then beyond that, you know, to do the power calculations, you need to have some guess at what is the likelihood of an effect of this. And I focused on turnover here. We were really interested in a bunch of things like teacher stress, teacher well-being, but haven't a clue what to estimate or what studies to uh, think about as um, likely effect sizes for this. And so um, we guessed, we were very nervous that we were looking for bigger effects than would be plausible and very excited that the childcare effects ended up being as large as they were because, you know, I think other policy relevant effect sizes would not have been detected in the sample size. So the fact that, you know, it was a 15 percentage point drop, I mean, we got, we got very lucky that the effect was as large as it is that it, we can go there. But it was, you know, it was, we felt like it was a risk worth doing, but it was very much on our mind. So that's a great point. Okay, so I just wanted to uh, thank uh, Daphna for, for joining us uh, today. Um, she's able to join us from her office in Charlottesville, um, uh, which 
I think is a, is a special treat. To, um, I know it's a rare moment for me to not be um, on the porch and with my kids and their virtual learning. So right. thank you for giving me an excuse to leave the house. Um, so um, I, th I think if we could all just use our, our Zoom clapping hands or something um, to, to thank Daphne, that would be great. Um, so actually it turns out today was the last peer seminar of this semester, but, but not the last peer activity of this semester. So for those on the call who want to join, um, so this Thursday, at from 3 to 5 p.m., so November 19th, 3 to 5 p.m., will be the Peer Summit um, Pitch Contest, where we've had three groups of, uh, three teams of researchers and districts. Um, so Fayette County in Kentucky, Oklahoma Department of Education, Rhode Island Department of Education has been working with a set of peer fellows and faculty fellows to develop a project. And they're gonna be pitching them to a panel of three folks from foundations. So Laverne Srinivasan, who runs the education group at the Carnegie Corporation of New York. Um, Laurie Steinberg, who's the senior program officer at the Overdeck Family Foundation and Jessica uh, Tsang, who is working at the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, they'll be on a panel providing feedback. But, but we need people to show up and vote. So um, if, if you can, uh, this Thursday, uh, 3 to 5, if you want to vote. And I'm, I'm sure some of your peers who are participating in this program might even pay you off to show up and vote on their behalf. Um, just don't tell them I said that. Um, and then we'll be resuming these seminars uh, next um, in February with uh, Catherine Strunk. So anyway, thanks to Daphna and thanks to all of you for, for joining us.